All right, uh, kia ora everyone. Welcome uh, to the event. Uh, I am Michael and I'm the chapter head of Platypus New Zealand, an affiliate of the Platypus Affiliated Society. The Platypus Affiliated Society organises reading groups, public fora, research and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old 1920s to 30s, new 1960s to 70s and post-political 1980s to 90s left for the possibility of emancipatory politics today. If you're interested to learn more about Platypus, visit platypus1917.org or you can check out our monthly open access journal, the Platypus Review, which is over on the table there, available for free. Uh, the latest issue features an interview with activist and former Green MP Sue Bradford, uh, which is um, printed off in a kind of A4 sheet over there. You can pick up if you like. Or you can listen to our podcast called Chip Platypus Says. We also host on campus activities, including film screenings. In two weeks, we'll hold our next public event, which will be a screening of the 1986 film Rosa Luxemburg. And the title of the panel tonight is What is Capitalism and Why Should We Be Against It? The panel prompt is as follows The present is characterised not only by a political crisis of the global neoliberal order but also by differing interpretations of the cause of this crisis, capitalism. If we are to interpret capitalism, we must also know how to change it. We ask the panellists to consider the following questions. What is capitalism? Is capitalism contradictory? If so, what is this contradiction and how does it relate to left politics? How has capitalism changed over time? And what have these changes been politically for the left? Does class struggle take place today? If so, how and what role should it play for the left? Is capitalism in crisis? If so, how and how should the left respond? If a new era of global capitalism is emerging, how do we envision the future of capitalism and what are the implications of this for the left? For the speakers tonight, unfortunately we've lost Ricardo Menendez March, the Green MP, unfortunately due to COVID which is a real shame, but uh, nevertheless, we will press on. I'll introduce the panellists in speaking order, starting with Joe Hendry. Joe is a member of the New Zealand Federation of Socialist Societies. He was previously a member of the Alliance and worked for the party as a parliamentary researcher from 2001 to 2002. He also works for First Union as a researcher Easter. from... <laughs> Easter. Uh, as a researcher from 2006 to 2018. In 2022, he graduated with a PhD from the University of Auckland in International Business, applying a neo gramscian analysis to civil society organisations, paying particular attention to the campaign against foreign control of Aotearoa in the political debate on foreign direct investment. Our next speaker, James Robb, joined the Trotskyist organisation Socialist Action League in 1975 while a student at Victoria University, believing revolutionary struggles were imminent worldwide. He witnessed revolutions in Iran and Nicaragua firsthand. He took jobs in meat works and car plants, taking part in strikes, the most significant being at Nissan in Wudi in 1986, the peak year for strikes. Around this time, Socialist Action League renamed itself the Communist League. Meanwhile, union movements worldwide began a decades-long retreat under neoliberalism. Ten years ago, James cut his last ties with the Communist League and started his blog, Worker at Large, he is back in industrial work now, and last year he stood for Parliament and the Pambio Otahuru electorate under the banner of Workers Now. And finally, Robert Reed is the recently retired President of First Union, having served as General Secretary and President of First, and before that, the National Distribution Union for a total of 14 years. He came to the left during the New Left era, when he participated in the Wellington Marxist-Leninist Organisation, a Maoist organisation founded by students at Victoria University and later renamed Workers' Communist League. Along with many other comrades, he left university and took the turn to industry, working at General Motors in Petone for 10 years prior to its closure, along with the rest of the motor vehicle assembly industry in New Zealand. Robert was active at a senior level within the Workers' Communist League until its demise around 1988, and following that, helped in the formation of New Labour and then the Alliance until its demise following the 2002 general elections. Robert has worked with unemployed groups as a staffer for Green Party member and old comrade Sue Bradford and as a trade unionist, including being one of the founders of Unite Union and for four years the coordinator of a Thailand-based Asia-Pacific Workers' Rights Organisation. So that's all the speakers. 
They all have 10 minutes to deliver their opening remarks, followed by initial responses lasting five minutes each, after which we'll open it up for an audience Q&A. Please hold your questions till the end, and if you have comments you want to share uh, that might be longer, we ask that you formulate them as an article and submit them to the Platypus Review, uh, which anyone can submit to. So with that, I will um, hand it over to Joe, and I'll um, set my handy timer here, and away we go. Oh, I didn't know I was going to be first. <laughs> All right. Hi there. My name's Joe Hendren. Um, again, when Michael first approached me to this, I thought, boy, this sounds like a massive big topic. So I'm not going to try and take it all, deal with it all, but I thought what I'd do is just try and introduce a few examples that might be useful for the discussion. Um, just in terms of, um, you know, there's often a question of, um, if you, you go back to things like in 1992, you had, uh, you had four, after the fall of the, um, the Soviet Union, you had Francis Fukuyama who said that, it was the, that capitalism represented the end of history. So after capitalism there was going to be nothing else. This is the, the high point of human civilization. You might not have sort of said it like that, but you get the drift. Um, now, while Francis now thinks that perhaps he might have not got that quite right, there are still a few people that believe things along those lines that somehow capitalism is the be all and end all and won't ever change. Um, I disagree. Um, now, I mean, what, another way I've, I've thought of thinking about this is if you, if you go back to the, um, the, the high point of the medieval times, when the high point of feudalism, right? Would you, could you have had a lord on, of the manor there, thinking he's doing very well out of feudalism, and thinking, feudalism, this has got to stay, this capitalism thing, that's never going to get going. So I guess that's why I just wanted to introduce that I think you, you do get social and political change perhaps even when it's not necessarily predicted by the people that might have a vested interest in keeping the status quo. Um, now, just, to, just in terms of, uh, and, and now this goes back to, oh, sorry, bah. <laughs> now, now, Adam Smith, he published a, um, an important book called The Wealth of Nations in 1776. Um, he's been called the, the father of modern capitalism. Now, um, he, there's a few... Um, to, 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 so the ideas and key ideas are about the idea of the invisible hand. So this describes the incentives of which and free markets can create the, um, the incentives for people to act in the public interest. That was the idea of it anyway. Interestingly, he didn't actually mention the invisible hand many times in the book, but it's been blown out ever since. Um, the second thing he talked about was a division of labour. Um, and that's um, about d dividing labour into component parts, so you allow some specialisation and you get efficiencies. Now, while I think, you know, let's talk about the division of labour in the invisible hand, is often makes its way to the invisible, to, to the economics textbooks. Often there's other stuff in Adam Smith that doesn't. Um, and see, for example, Adam Smith actually was quite, realised the advantages of the division of labour, but he also recognised how it could destroy people that it wasn't going to be any good if you went to an extreme level of a division of labour. And in some ways you could say that he actually preempted um, Marx's theory of the alienation that came later, the idea of being alienated from your work. So I just think that's quite interesting. I mean, I, I think I picked that point up from Noam Chomsky and sort of saying, well, funnily enough, these things are not quoted much in the economics textbooks. Right. Um, so just in terms of... Um, Capitalism is that um, I think the key, key thing that I think for those of us that are sceptical of it is that it um, leads to mass inequity. And we're, we're seeing that at the moment. And you've seen recent works by people like Thomas Piketty, who's written a, a book on uh, capitalism in the 21st century about 10 years ago. Um, and I think I've, I don't have a, um, a screen here, so unfortunately I've got graphs, but I can only draw them like this. So. You know, you have to do, do them like this. So, you know, it's, it's like economic charades of a different kind. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, if you imagine here, you've got about uh, 1910, you've got, there's a very high level of inequity. So the, um, the percentage of um, share that was held by the top 1% of um, the, um, the, the top 1% richest in the Anglo-Saxon countries was very high. So it was sitting at about, you know, about 22%. And as, as you go through the 20th century and you've got things like the Depression and some of the reaction to that in terms of what happened with um, Keynesian ideas 
and sort of trying to change some of the, um, the extremes of capitalism, you brought this down. But then you see, around 1970, the, um, the, the share of global income that's held by the top 1% started to go up again. So you've got this, this loop that's happened. Yeah? So that's the, we're at, yeah. So, yeah. So I guess just, uh, just in terms of my own personal philosophy, so this is the first thing I have sort of thought about this for quite a while. Um, but I guess I tend to um, resist utopian style thinking. Whether it's challenging the utopian idea that the free market will be absolutely perfect, or whether it's actually the what you might call the more anti-intellectual end of the Marxist spectrum, um, who, um, who prioritise action over thinking and try and claim that it's, it's somehow opposites. Um, now, when Karl Marx said um, philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways, the point is to change it, I think sometimes that gets misinterpreted in that way. Because I mean, in some ways I think one of the most important things about that sentence is actually the punctuation. Because if you think about the point is to change it, it's the comma. So it's a saying that you can think about the world and you can change it. Okay? So that's, and this is um, one person that really influenced my thinking was the New Zealand writer Bruce Jessen. Um, and he wrote in 1983 that action and theory are commonly regarded as opposites or at least as alternatives. Action is preferred as being practical and showing commitment, whereas theory is disparaged as indulgent, elitist, and removed from reality. So, I mean, of course, you know, I agree with Jason here that you, know, you, you need both. Um, and so, in order to achieve change, not only do we need to organise, we also need to develop an intellectual base that allows us to support those aims. So, this is why I think meetings like we're having today are quite worthwhile. Yep, so I'll, I'll leave it there at the moment. You can come back. Great, thank you. Uh, James? Okay, thanks. Welcome. Thanks for coming, everybody. My, my name is James Robb. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the, the essence of capitalism is, is production for profit, where economic life is dictated by the profit needs of the owners of the factories, the, the, the railways, the banks, and so on, the, the wealthy class of owners, rather than economic life designed around meeting human needs. Now, the, the, there is a widespread belief that profit, the profit needs of capitalism largely coincide with human needs through the mechanism of the, of the um, supply and demand laws of the market. That is, that as soon as there's a need for something, the price of that thing will go up, therefore it will become profitable to, to produce it, and capital will be poured into that branch of industry. Uh, and, and, and so, indirectly, uh, production meets human needs. Um, well, there was, a, there was an element of truth in that assertion, especially near the beginning, nearly in the early years of capitalism. Uh, uh, capitalism did certainly develop the productive forces of humanity to an unheard of extent. Um, but today we're in a different phase of capitalism, in its senile decline, and increasingly the profit demands of the capitalists are an obstacle to, to meeting human needs. And I'm going to uh, discuss that, uh, especially the social needs of human beings, not, not our individual needs, but our social needs. Look at how the market, if you want to see how the market meets the need for efficient urban transport, get on the southern motorway at about this time of night and you'll see how, how hopelessly inadequate the market is to, to meet that social need. How does the market meet, meet the need to combat climate change and, and CO2 emissions? They set up the emissions trading scheme, a new form of fictitious capital through which the, the carbon dioxide emitters can, can pay indulgences for their sins and then, and then trade them, uh, 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 all of which has nothing to do with reducing carbon dioxide emissions. In, in all of these ways, uh, profit just is an obstacle to human, human needs and human progress. Um, there are many contradictions of capitalism. It leads to the sharpest contradictions in, in, in human, sharpest class contradictions in human history, and therefore the, the, the most uh, 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 catastrophic wars, uh, and, and many, other, many other contradictions. I just want to talk about one, as, as, as Joe said, it's a very big topic tonight's thing. I want to talk about the contradiction between 
the, the, the competitive struggle of the capitalists to maximize their profit and, and the way that this very struggle leads in the long term to, to a, a, a reduction in the, in, the, in the rate of profit, the, decline, the tendency of the, the, the rate of profit to decline. Because I think this contradiction is key to understanding Joe's other point, which is that capitalism is not going to be around forever. This is, this is, this is capitalism's death sentence. It's a, it's a law of, of the functioning of capitalism. Um, it's, it's not easy to describe in, in a few words, but uh, uh, this, is, this is roughly the, the way it works. The, competitive, the competition of capitalists among, among themselves uh, drives them to, to uh, get a competitive advantage by introducing labor-saving machines so that they can produce the product cheaper than their competitors. When they do that, they get a temporary advantage over their, uh, over their competitors. But the problem is the value of any commodity on the market is, is ultimately determined by the amount of labor embodied in that, in that uh, uh, commodity. And so eventually, competition will drive all the other capitalists to, to introduce the same labor-saving machines. And what happens then is that the price of the commodity, the value of the commodity, goes down because there is now less labor in, in, embodied in it. It, it, it. It's being produced more efficiently. More efficiently. Now, if the, if the capitalists can still sell their increased production, they'll still make a profit, but their rate of profit will have fallen because the, the rate of the, the, the return they get on each dollar invested, because they've had to invest, they've all had to invest in the new machines now. And this is an extremely uh, uh, important thing to understand about capitalism and, and why it's in crisis now. Uh, 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 and and why it's not going to be around forever. The capitalists have attempted to reverse this falling rate of profit, uh, especially since the 1980s when it became extremely acute. Uh, they've made significant cuts to workers' wages, they've sped up the pace of work, they've lengthened the working day in, in, a, in a massive way. I mean, when I started work, uh, at the beginning of my working life, the eight-hour day was the norm. Where I work now in a metal recycling factory, 12 hours is the norm. Everybody, just about, apart from me, uh, works, at, works at 12 hour day. No overtime rates, nothing, just 12 hours straight. It takes us right back to the beginning of the 19th century in some ways. Uh, they've they've uh, massively uh, increased the recruitment of migrant workers under oppressive and exploitative conditions. There are whole industries now, like horticulture, which depend on the super exploitation of migrant labour. And, and they would shut down rather than hire local born workers. That's what we saw during COVID when, 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 when the, the migrants were returned home. But all of, and these are significant attacks on, 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 on workers. They've driven down our working. But, but, but nowhere near enough to restore capitalism, capitalist profitability. So what they did next was they shut down the entire industries and, and shifted their operations to Asia and China in particular. Um, uh, uh, whole industries, clothing industry, footwear industry, small engineering, that used to be quite big in, in New Zealand, all gone, all gone. Big factories, Fisherman Pike factory making appliances, huge place out in, in East Tamaki, shut down, relocated to Asia. Uh, the same thing was happening across North America, across Europe and the United Kingdom. Uh, capitalism in those old industrial powerhouses, the UK, the United States and so on, it's increasingly parasitic drawing the wealth from the rest of the world and, and living off the, 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 uh, the financial and trade advantages that they, they that, that accrued to them in the period where they were industrially dominate, dominant from the past. Well, how does the falling rate of profit manifest in, in New Zealand today? For one thing, it's a major element in the housing crisis. What happens when the rate of profit in industry falls uh, the way it has, is the capitalists start looking for bigger profits outside of production altogether. So you get this massive, in, in a lot of countries you get speculation on the stock market, uh, trade in all kinds of uh, fictitious capital, treasury bonds, uh, debt packages, soybean futures, Bitcoin, half of them you don't even know what they are. I don't know what they really, what they really represent. But they're, they're sort of paper values, pieces of paper with an entitlement to an income, and and, and, and these get traded at a phenomenal rate. Some of some of the stock, Facebook, for instance, is valued at this massive 
value that has nothing to do with the value of its assets or, or, or anything, uh, and it will evaporate at a certain point. Uh, in New Zealand, the favourite form of this form of, of, of sort of unproductive speculative, speculative grasp for profits is residential real estate, and it has been for a, for a long time. 40,000 empty houses in Auckland alone, ghost houses, just where capitalists are parking their money, speculating on, 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 on capital gains in the future when, when, when the prices go up. Second thing, it, it leads to unimaginable levels of debt. You, you read these figures and, my God, that's a, a huge amount of debt. And then you come back a few years later and look at the same thing. Oh, it's doubled or trebled. And the, this debt is piling up because it's the only way to keep the, the, the wheels of commerce uh, turning. But it's making the financial system, the world financial system, extremely unstable and, and, and liable to collapse. What form that collapse takes, I don't, you, you can't predict. Uh, 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 but you can see it coming. Third thing is the collapsing infrastructure you see all, all, all around you uh, uh, and, and growing threats to public safety and the environment coming from the same thing. For 30 years, local governments, central governments have, have just deferred payment on, on the necessary maintenance, on, on the water supply, uh, the roads. It, so y y you get these sinkholes opening up in Parnell, sewage pumped into the harbours in Auckland and Wellington, leaky water pipes, that it's just, it's, it's the, the chickens coming home to roost. Uh, one more minute. Okay. Um, uh, and the same thing is happening in, 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 the, in the private sector too, uh, uh, where that ferry nearly ran aground with 900 people on board a year ago uh, 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 because of a, a rubber seal that cost less than $1,000, hadn't been replaced in the way it had to. Um, uh, but the most important product of the falling rate of profit is China. Um, uh, the historic shift of capital investment to low-wage China gave capitalism a 30-year extension of its senile phase. Um, but this is coming to an end in China too. I'll have to continue in the extension time. Uh, excellent. Thanks so much for that. Sorry, I didn't know my phone was going to make it a fun Great. <laughs> um, okay, thank you so much for that. Let's turn to Robert. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, and kia ora uh, Michael, and thank you all for giving up your evening uh, to listen um, to at least one old fogey and, and some uh, slightly younger people. Um, I, I'm a, I'm a, given a, been a product of um, disciplined labour, I've um, answered all of your questions as little essays. So I hope um, that will um, I hope that will suffice. And being the last one, a number of uh, points that previous speakers have made, of course, um, uh, but I think it works quite well because, um, it, in some ways, hopefully this this might sort of summarise some of the, the things that we've been saying, but also um, will bring in some some differences of, of, of views which we need to have tonight as well. So the first question of us was, what is capitalism? Um, and our previous speakers have particularly dealt on the economic side of that, being the private ownership of the means of production, distribution, exchange, the system of the private extraction of surplus value. I mean, those are the economic things which um, Marx and Engels um, uh, in their work um, were able to define as part of, of capitalism. But also Marx brought in that social, psychological aspect, which uh, Joe also mentioned, that it is a system of the alienation of workers, the alienation of people um, from, firstly, the what they are producing, because the value of that gets appropriated um, to the employing class, um, but also alienated from that, from society and from the, the, the norms of society as well. Um, thirdly, capitalism is the next stage of, or was the next stage of development of human society following primitive communism, then feudalism and capitalism. So it was seen by those who have analysed it, and again previous speakers have said it's not something that's going to last forever, um, but is a an um, economic um, uh, and political um, uh, process that we are going through. Um, it's a 
another version of class society to feudalism, um, with um, uh, but class society nonetheless, and it has different actors, different classes uh, than feudalism does. And then finally, which perhaps we haven't spoken about so much, is that um, if we use the word capitalism, we are also referring to the capitalist state. Um, and everything, is, uh, particularly probably Lenin took that a bit further than Marx, um, of uh, that state um, which is um, he called, um, and, and that state becoming imperialist powers, particularly from the metropolitan countries, and as Lenin called it, um, imperialism being the highest stage of capitalism. And I think as we look around the world today, at uh, um, different parts of the world, um, where uh, the gruesome um, uh, genocide and other things are, are happening, we can actually see that that is still very much part of capitalism um, uh, in an analysis of it. So is capitalism contradictory? Um, I had to say, of course it is. Um, it's the, um, Marx said not only capitalism, but every single thing in the world is contradictory. It's made up of contradictions, and that's a way of analysing things um, so that we can see how we might be able to change uh, those things. Marx analysed the contradictions under capitalism between workers and the bourgeoisie, between labour and capital, and under capitalism and imperialism, further contradictions have risen between, as I said, the metropolitan imperialist countries uh, and the pillaged third world. With, and with the threat, which James um, alluded to, not alluded to, but spoke about of global warming, um, further contradictions are exposed. Um, so, say the contradiction, for example, really between the whole human race and our future, surviving or not, um, and um, uh, the um, uh, possibilities or probabilities, unless something is done about it, of um, what is happening with global um, uh, with climate change. There are other contradictions also at work, um, whether they are contradictions relating to gender, ethnicity, and that in my view they all have their own particular characteristics under capitalism which might be under some otherism or other societal norms have different characteristics but exist nonetheless. So for me the job of left politics armed with the dialectical and the historical method of analysis um, that um, Marxism gives us is really to work out how these contradictions relate to each other, how they interact with each other and chart a way forward, not just for the emancipation of the working class but also for all other oppressed groups uh, under capitalism and for the planet as a whole um, as capitalism um, kicks the shit out of it. Um, how has capitalism changed over time and what have these changes meant politically for the left? Again, I've said yes, it has, um, and uh, this is one of the key challenges for the left. Many parts of capitalism today would have been completely unrecognisable in the 19th and early 20th centuries. As a self-criticism, I think the left has not kept up with these changes, either through analysis or practice. We still have our dialectical and historical materialist method of analysis, but we have to remember that even that method was developed at a time when science or natural science was naming and orders, species, genus, family, putting periodic the ta tables into little boxes of what makes up the elements. And that was a scientific method which Marx and Engels have adopted for their work. But now natural science is giving us quantum physics and other things like that. And I'm not sure whether we have today the Marxist equivalent of that in our understanding of what the new forces are and the new things that we have to address. Does the class struggle take place today? And if so, what role should it play for the left? Um, again, yes, of course. Uh, we have classes and class contradictions. Um, but we have them today between also the Musks, Bezos, Zuckerbergs, Allison, Buffets of the world, 
and the global proletariat and um, peasantry a contradiction, I think, which is so much greater uh, than the contradiction between labour and capital, if you like, has ever been. For me, the role of the left is to provide agency for those who are oppressed by the current capitalist imperialist system, that is the working class who are exploited at the point of production, but also those oppressed by imperialism and settler colonisation. And here we must mention, as I have earlier on, the current atrocities and genocide that is taking place in Palestine. Is capitalism in crisis? If so, and how should the left respond? Again, I think yes, um, but, um, and probably you've done the same, James, is that in our, probably over the years, every year we've said the capital system's in crisis, we've put it in our newspapers and that sort of thing. So I, I think, yes, that goes without saying, but it doesn't necessarily help us sort of under, just by saying it is in crisis. Because on the other hand, I think capitalism, particularly for us on the left and our predecessors, has been um, much more uh, resilient than we ever would have thought. And I think even than Marx and Engels would have thought. Um, and so it's understanding where that resilience comes from. Um, if we are, if it is, and I believe it is, its own grave digger, uh, then, yeah, um, when's the bloody hole going to be finished um, to put capitalism in? Because we, we often see other, other things um, uh, when we think it's near, near and on its last gasp, something else will occur um, and the, the capitalist economic system and social system will continue. And the final question was in a new era of global capitalism emerging, how do we envisage the future of capitalism and what are the implications of that for the left? Um, I think we need to ask ourselves what form this capitalism has developed into. And if we can be a bit heretical, um, whether it is even still the same capitalism or another system. Funnily enough, Joe, I've put here, I don't want to be like Fukuyama, <laughs> declaring the end of history, um, but I mean more like Yanis Varoufakis describing today's society as being techno-feudalism. His thesis is that with the rise of the feudal techno-lords, such as the ones I've mentioned before, Bezos, Musk, um, uh, Zuckerberg, that the accumulation of mega-wealth is not anymore through the appropriation of surplus value on a work site, but through the rents that the techno-feudalists are seizing from all of the economic activity uh, that they control. Some may say that arguing over words is not important, but we need to know who we are fighting and what system we are fighting if we have to have any chance of success. We need to be brave and sure of ourselves enough that we can look at other methods of analysis and test them and see if that is helpful for their own. After all, and I hope I have the comma in the right place, Joe. <laughs> I have ended with philosophers <laughs> may interpret the world, but the point is to change it. Kia ora koutou. Awesome. Uh, thanks very much to our speakers. Um, we'll turn over now to an opportunity where each speaker can uh, respond and uh, offer their thoughts. While they collect their thoughts, I'll just attempt to synthesise, summarise um, kind of the through lines and the points of convergence, divergence. Uh, Joe characterised capitalism as a historical epoch that is uh, kind of caught up in an impasse, one that reproduces itself and naturalises itself in the minds of those who live under it, uh, potentially uh, coming to see capitalism as just an inevitability. Uh, so Joe, Joe brought out the fact of consciousness, uh, and in doing so he referred to Marx's legal thesis on Feuerbach, um, and this kind of um, interpretation of it where action is counterposed to theory, but Joe said that it was kind of more uh, interrelated, or to use the Marxist parlance, if you'll forgive me, dialectical, um, that you need both in order to achieve change. Uh, James emphasised market competition as producing um, temporary advantages over competitors, but efficiency 
which comes at the cost of uh, human life and human labor. At the same time, uh, capitalism, through all this productivity, is eating itself and entering its senile decline. Uh, Robert highlighted the singularity of Marxism as a method that can offer a way to understand reality and the necessity of emancipating the working class. Uh, Robert also raised the resilience of the left, but also the possibility that capitalism has changed its form. Uh, the question would be, is it still the same capitalism, Robert asks. And um, uh, with that, I will turn it over to Joe, if you want an opportunity just to share your thoughts. Mm, sure. Okay. Um, no, I guess there's just to, you know, some, some really interesting thoughts there. In, t- in terms of Marxism, I think it's useful to distinguish the different strands of Marxism. It's not all the same. In particular, in terms of um, the, the original relationships of the major figures together. Like often there's one school of thought that thinks Marx... Engels, Lenin, they're all saying the same thing. Well, they, you know, they, they, well, they, you know, they're sort of saying there's a, there's a, there's a strand you can take right through, all right? But there's others who question that, particularly those that went back and looked at the, um, the early Marx that was actually discovered later on after the Soviet Union was formed, um, and this was in the 30s and 40s. They, well, the, the, some of the new stuff is what I call the humanist Marx coming out. You know, things like theory about alienation and things like this. And what's quite interesting, I think, with some of that is that you can even, there's even people that suggest there might have been difference of opinion between Marx and Engels. And even what, the, um, what Robert mentioned in terms of the scientific question, I think that Engels was much more on the scientific Marxism end, whereas I think um, Marx probably had more of an influence of, uh, from German philosophy. Which had sort of a probably a, a, a so he was a materialist, but you'd have to say a, probably a strange kind of materialist. So yeah, I guess I just wanted to put that out because that also relates to things like Pramsky that came later. So just sort of you know so in all these things, don't think Marxism is this big thing that gets put into one volume because it's it's a bit you know all sorts of strands come out of that. Um, and just uh, following on also just what Robert was saying about. Um, you know, about Lenin when he's sort of saying about the um, being a sort of the being a capitalism being a state of imperialism, really, and that it's a relationship of capitalism to imperialism. Um, is that um, I think what you can, this can be quite useful to relate that to the globalization debate. Um, for example, you see with um, capitalism or even with globalization, they try and say that this is never ending, this is inevitable, it'll only get better, it'll only go one way, right? You'll only ever get more trade in the world. You'll only ever get more capitalism. Well, actually, that's not true. I mean, if you actually look at the history, you'll see it's more like this. So there's been waves of it. So, um, so you can sort of see it from like in the um, the 19th century. You could sort of had really a world that was really that was where um, Marx and Engels were writing it was more characterised probably by free trade and things like that at that point. Whereas um, then you went into the, um, the 1870s and 1880s, you got the Long Depression. Okay? So that's when capitalism just started to go asunder. Hang on, this is not meant to happen. So, and then you've got, um, so what happened during that is that the previous system of, um, of free trade and open markets was dismantled. So this actually speaks to the argument when they say that this is how inevitable when you actually say, well, actually, after the great, you know, it actually has been dismantled before. So none of these things are necessarily going to stay the same thing all the time. So then you also saw this with the Great Depression in the 1930s. It was a similar thing. It was the, the World Depression with the, the stock market crash and the, um, the prevailing economic theories at the time there would be neoclassism. They sort of would say, oh no, we've got to keep retrenching, we can't invest in, you know, essentially almost that really made the depression worse. So and this is what one of the things that led to Keynesian sort of ideas that when you're in a um, depression, the government should invest. So it means that the, the economy can get going again. Yeah, so... Um, So yeah, just, just, yeah, just to, to, to end on this is that um, so I think that Wolf actually, I went to a very interesting talk by a Marxist economist called Michael Roberts. He's actually got a blog. Um, there might be some theoretical difference between us, but I thought some of his predictions for what might happen in the economy now are quite interesting. 
particularly if you look in terms of globalization, in terms of the imperialism sort of argument, is if, the, if it, we've gone from a period where there's been more globalization since the 1970s and been told by people like Francis Fukuyama it can only ever be one way, well, it's actually starting to reverse again. So you see a lot of countries are experiencing a combination of higher inflation and lower growth. And there's actually been people questioning whether, will this actually mean we actually could see like an, a long depression like we saw in the 19th century? You know, this could last for quite a long time. And even since, not in, since 1970, um, the ratio of global trade to the global gross domestic product it rose to about, to about 60%. But since 2008, it's been slowly going down again. So the, the, the directions are changing. So, um, and also you can sort of see how um, com companies and countries are trying to um, grow, grow uh, more, trying to get more profit. They're starting to borrow. And again, what's happening is that um, the ratio of global debt is, um, to GDP is going up as well. So these are signs that when you read in the newspaper saying that capitalism, oh, it's just going to get better next year, it might not be the case. So I guess that's where I wanted to leave that at the moment. Great, thanks, Jim. My turn? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I, I don't want to comment on all these things, but I think uh, uh, Robert made a very good point in saying that the left hasn't caught up with the changes in the world. I think that's very true. And I think the biggest change that, that the left, at least in the English-speaking world, and uh, I'm sure beyond that as well, the, the, the biggest change that we haven't come to grips with yet is China. Um, the, the historic shift of the center of gravity of world capitalism from the United States to China it is, is, is a massive, massive change, and, and, and it's, it takes a while to get your head around it. Um, it the, the first thing, that it, I think I mentioned at the end of my talk, first talk, it, the, the huge development in China, it was the rising tide in world capitalism that, kept, that raised all boats. It, it's, it saved world capitalism. It mitigated the effects of the global financial crisis of, of uh, of, of 10, 15 years ago, um, <clears throat> which, which could have been a lot more catastrophic, but it, it didn't really affect China. Um, uh, uh, China is by far the world's greatest economy in terms of value created. You read everywhere, it's the second biggest economy. That's based on GDP, gross domestic product, which measures a whole lot of things which aren't creation of value. It measures all these little parasitic operations that I was talking about before, all, all the sort of currency exchanges and, 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 and stock market speculation and so on. That's all counted as, as GDP. That's all economic activity. Which count, and, and so it, 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 the GDP statistics vastly overrates the, 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 the value creation in the United States and underrates it in, in China. Uh, I've got a graph. <laughs> um, which <laughs> you, you don't even need to see the details to, to see it. You can probably see it from back there. This is world steel production uh, uh, in, in the United States, Japan, Russia, Germany, China, uh, India, and Korea at, at the end of each of the last five or six decades. The uh, United States was the biggest steel producer, sort of slowly going down. Japan up there with the United States going down. Russia down, up a little bit, but still. Germany way low, not getting it. China just skyrocketing. Steel is an absolutely central commodity for, for all industry. You need steel for construction, for shipbuilding, for, for car manufacturing, for appliance manufacturing, for electronics, everything. It, steel is absolutely central. And China produces more than half of the world's steel in the one country alone. India's going up too. Uh, oh, yeah, it's on the graph. But starting from a much lower position and still way, way below China. This is, this is, the, this is the central uh, change in, in world capitalism, which, which I don't think we've, we've uh, caught up with. Now, it's been booming for 50, 60 years, the longest, uh, unbelievably long continuous boom, which has come to an end now. China is also being drawn into the world crisis of capitalism, a huge uh, 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 debt balloon 
blown up in China as well. Uh, a real estate, a, a real estate bubble that they just don't know what to do with. That's that's probably the most fragile aspect of the Chinese economy. Uh, uh, financial stability, uh, instability, uh, and a debt mountain. Like all imperialist powers, because China is the foremost imperialist power in my opinion, uh, it, it will resort to military means to defend its profits. And so a, com a, a confrontation between moribund, declining United States and China it, it, it is it, it's just about unthinkable, the consequences. If you think of the nuclear bomb dropped on Hiroshima, that was a city of less than half a million people, and there are now 30 million people living in Shanghai. You, you, you can just, it, it's just, you, it, it's hard to, hard to imagine if, if, if such a catastrophic war were to happen. The, the consequence, and, and it, it's inevitable. It's driven by capitalism unless the working class intervenes and, and, and overthrows the dictatorship of profit. That, that is the, that, that is the, that, that is the, uh, the, the, um, one of the best reasons to oppose capitalism. Uh, 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 Robert also has, uh, answered the question, is there a class struggle? He said, yes, I think that's the correct answer. But it has to come with a qualifier. In, in, in New Zealand at the moment, the class struggle is extremely muted. And in the rest of, uh, just about everywhere in the world, the, the class struggle is, is very muted. Um, uh, and China is the key to that too, understanding that. Uh, the, the working class power and self-confidence in, in the previous period, 40 years ago, had been concentrated in the advanced economies of, of, of North America, Japan, Europe to a certain extent. The partial deindustrialization of these countries, the shift of capital to China, robbed the working class of its power, of part of its power, reduced it. It wasn't just in the imagination, it, it really was reduced. And, 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 that's, and, and that takes a while to recover from. It doesn't mean workers are powerless in a country like New Zealand, but it has meant a complete break with the past. All the old organizations and institutions fall apart and new ones have to be built from scratch. But it's not the first time this has happened in history. There was a similar break with the past in 1914. All the working class organizations of, of Europe shattered on the outbreak of the war, and yet it wasn't the end of history then. Uh, it was a, a, a revolutionary breakthrough took place in Russia a few years later. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting period to be alive. That's it. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert? Um, what I might do is just, um, because quite correctly, uh, both um, Joe and James have sort of concentrated on the, if you like, the economic substructure of what's mm -hmm. happening. But just maybe to spend the last couple of minutes to sort of open up, well, what does that mean for the superstructure, for the for politics, for and and the thing that worries me at the moment is um, uh, is really is seeing that the, uh, the the forces, I guess, that um, are opposing us. Um, um, were either sort of the extreme neoliberal libertarian act type thing, or of the more reactionary um, New Zealand first type thing. Um, but not only in New Zealand, but around the world, they have now met reaction libertarianism and react and right wing reaction have actually met and are holding hands, and uh, so, some of you might have studied this more than me, and it'd be really interesting to hear from you. The thing like the Atlas Foundation, which is mentioned um, uh, more and more, and the funding of the right-wing think tanks and that type of thing, is leaving us, I think, on the left for dead. Um, and um, it's... Um, uh, I really worry uh, that, uh, you know, and, and, and Trumpism is part of that. Um, uh, um, and, yeah, and looking looking at, not that the British Labour Party was up to much anyway, but look, looking at the UK uh, and Starmer probably worse than um, the Conservative Party in, in, in many ways. So... 
Yes, it, it's, it's, so it's, it's, and I'll leave that as a question perhaps, as, as, as well as the economic side, how do we deal with the politics? Mm. And the politics where again, like an economic, and they flow, Marxists believe they flow from the economics, and I think everything that James and, and Joe has said is a reason why we are getting these strange alliances and coming together now, um, but not Strange is probably the wrong word. Dangerous is probably a better word. And how do we on the left um, oppose that, oppose on that sort of superstructural level, as well as doing what we can um, uh, in challenging um, the economic substructure that exists at the same time? Great. Thank you very much. So what we'll do for the final part of our discussion tonight is we'll open it up to an audience Q&A, so please, you know, um, put your thinking caps on and don't feel shy. Um, I will, um, just to give you time to formulate your questions, um, I'll ask you a quick question that kind of um, ties together the threads of the panel so far. Um, just kind of beginning with maybe the first and the last point from the opening remarks where uh, Joe brought up the question of capitalism naturalising itself. Um, and uh, Robert um, kind of uh, resonating with this element thesis on Feuerbach by Marx, this notion that uh, philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world, the point, however, is to change it, that um, very famous quote on the left. That, that poses the question that if capitalism naturalizes itself, um, you know, how do we know that capitalism is a distinct problem? How do we know what it is? How do we, um, you know, it's akin to maybe like, how does a fish know what water is, right? Uh, to put it another way, Robert made a great comment about being the product of disciplined labour, where um, you know there was a time when perhaps receiving a training on the left uh, meant something different to how it means today. And what's happened in between? What, what, how would you reflect upon how you came to understand what capitalism is through your trajectory as a leftist, and how do you think things differ now? Uh, let's, uh, just whoever wants to take it. Maybe all three. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, great. So, can you just repeat, repeat the question here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. How did you come to understand Marxism when you were young, and how are people trained on the left today, and uh, what do you think has changed? I, th I think for myself and uh, my generation, in some ways, on the uh, on, on the left, it was, of, and and you know, because you pointed that out to me when you invited me to be here, my trajectory was from being a young national. Uh, member of the Junior National Party to, to by the end of my, to organising the mass campaign against conscription and Nick Minute being a, 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 a communist um, at Victoria University. Um, it, it was not actually the working class issues that took us leftwards, it, it was the international situation, was the US imperialist war on Vietnam, and those sorts of things. We came, uh, me probably a wee bit less than other people, but we came from sort of middle class backgrounds. Um, but it was it was meeting Marxism and, and their being around, and whether it was, even though we were competing, like when, um, whether it was in the SAL or, or the WCL or, or, or even the uh, Communist Party and Socialist Unity Party at that time, uh, but I pick, think particularly for SAL and, and, and uh, WCL, it, it was in studying the Marxism and, and realising how the economy worked and how the working class was oppressed and how the working class was a motor of history so that all of these other things couldn't just be solved by a group of petty bourgeois students going on rallies and other things that we actually, I'm going to be in my Maoist now, dig tunnels deep. Uh, and, and, and as and both of our organisations, yeah, as students, we left study and went and worked at factories for many, many years. So, yeah, those were sort of the, the things that, that um, uh, were happening, yeah, um, in my, if you like, transition. Uh, period. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess the, um, the way I sometimes think of it, I think sometimes politics doesn't actually start with ideas. It often, when you're a school kid, probably starts with emotions. And uh, I remember my father, um, when he was a nine-year-old, he can still remember the whole 
absolute feeling of dread that went through the House when National won the 1949 election. So that was one of my father's first memories. Um, and I remember that, um, that I had something very similar when I could saw Dad getting very angry at the fourth Labour government and sort of saying, Dad, what's going wrong? What's, what's going on? Why is this wrong? So essentially, I started by um, resp responding to an emotion and then getting the, uh, the, uh, the ideas that came behind that. Um, and probably, that was probably where my politics was set. I mean, my, um, my uncle was probably um, taking the piss out of me a bit, I think, when he said that my, um, my grandfather, who used to drive trains, was about as far left as you can be without being a communist. And he was sort of looking at me with a knowing smile. <laughs> so, um, but, so, but then for me, I think, I just started, I was doing a philosophy degree, so I was just often quite questioning, really. So I probably gravitated towards things that were saying the opposite anyway, just to see the sense of how I could understand the ideas. So actually some of the things that I first read in economics were things like Bruce Jesson, who's a Marxist but well worth reading because he's a really thoughtful one. And he, you know, he does, he, you know, goes through the ideas and particularly talks about the New Zealand context, which I think is useful too. Um, the other pe people I started reading was people like Wolfgang Rosenberg about the sort of how the, um, how the, how the Keynesian economy worked and why it was so successful and how somehow some of that all success went into a big memory hole and why that happened. So that for me was probably going and then going into joining the alliance and working in parliament and then through the unions where, where I came across Mr Robert who's actually, Robert has been an old friend of mine for years. So um, it's, uh, so yeah, that's sort of, that, that was sort of my journey, I guess. Okay. Uh, I, I think mine's a little bit more like Robert's. Um, the, the, the main thing I would say that it was very, very much easier uh, for people growing up in the 1970s to find their way to political action and, and a, a, a Marxist view of capitalism uh, because there was a great deal of political ferment going on generally. Uh, I, I came along a little bit later than the, you know, I wasn't part of the anti-Vietnam War movement or anything. I was a bit, I was, I was still in early high school at that time. Uh, but there was the, the anti-apartheid struggle was what drew me in. I, I remember just watching the, the, the first TV footage of the, of, the, uh, of, of the Soweto uprising in, mm. when was that, 1973 or something, 74, uh, yeah, middle 70s anyway, and, and just thinking I, I know what side I'm, I'm on in that. Um, and, and, then, and then sort of through engaging in political actions around, around specific demands like that, just doing some, doing some reading and, and, uh, and, and, and joining a, an organisation which fought for uh, uh, along working class basis. But that was all in the context of, of huge ferment and action taking place in the working class. Um, uh, it was, it was a, it was a, it, I, I mean, it was, always wanted more than there was there, but compared to today, it, it was, it was a period of, of great union organization, uh, uh, first big sort of, um, struggles by women workers, Maori workers taking the lead in a whole, in, in, in various central unions like the meat workers and the timber workers unions. Um, and, 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 and sort of even within the bureaucratized unions, there were little sort of more democratic organizations of workers themselves sort of getting organized, even in the Engineers Union of Auckland, which is one of the most bureaucratic. Um, uh, but, and so when I got a job in this end, for instance, there was this little, there was this little um, uh, factory-wide Union that was run in a very democratic way. We had we had meetings every month, and and, and where, where anybody stop work meetings where everybody could raise raise issues and so on. And so it was very, uh, it, it was a real sort of education in the in the in the class struggle, which is much more difficult today. It's hard to convince anybody of of uh, of Marxist ideas, I think, in, in, which are based on 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 the working class leading society when, when workers are not really uh, engaged in politics yet. And, 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 and this is, it's a hard thing to break out of at the moment. Great, um, let's open up to audience questions. 
Uh, so firstly, um, I think it was you, Robert, who brought up this this meeting of you know uh, neoliberalism mm. and uh, this, or, or was it you, James? I mean, it was you, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. 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 So it, it's interesting to bring it up because um, in the uh, book Black Shirts and Reds uh, by Michael Parenti, he talks about how um, uh, Nazism in in Germany 1933 when the Nazi Party, uh, you know came in, uh, you know, obviously it, it um, sold itself as a national socialist, uh, you know, with the you know, red flag and the, you know, the swastika and everything, which was all an intentional design to say, we're a workers' movement. When in reality, uh, obviously they, they uh, you know, basically it was state capitalism, is what it was, uh, you know, under the Nazis, it was, um, you know, the corporations had, had uh, you know, huge control and a huge profit and everything and had access to uh, you know the, the you know basically everything you know the whole living from imperialism that took place there. Um, so there is if you say you know this is also actually a new thing. Uh, this meeting of reactionary and and you know that was actually something that happened you know 80 years ago, almost 100 years ago already. So I just thought I'd add that. Um, and then uh, some other questions. Um, you mentioned, it was you who brought up, uh, capitalism developing through phases, uh, you know, from, what was it, you said, uh, these proto-communists to uh, feudal... Society to Society development, sorry, society development through phases. Do you think this is a specific condition of Europe or a certain part of the world, or do you think that relates more to human nature, or do you think there's some other element in here? Um. I sort of don't believe in human nature as, as a construct. Um, you're right, I, I think we're all Eurocentric, uh, and so is Marxism. Um, so, and I think we always have to sort of test it and, and, and judge it, and also read and you know, take on board some of the wonderful other sort of Marxist, you know, Marxist sort of thinkers from third world and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so, um, so, so the question was whether uh, whether um, the, 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 it's a condition of Europe that, that, yeah, that yeah, yeah, that yeah. So, yeah, I, so I think you you always have to keep challenging yourself. Um, but I, uh, but I guess this, the Greek economist and politician um, Giannis Varoufakis is challenging me at the moment by asking that question, has capitalism changed so much that it's not capitalism anymore, it's actually a new thing. So, and that's a good debate to have, because even no matter which way we decide, or I mean, it, it, it helps us understand, I think, and pick apart more what is that, whether we call it capitalism or techno feudalism, it helps us understand that, and hopefully helps us try and find methods to defeat it. Can I just add a little bit to that? Uh, I think it was probably uh, theoretically possible that human society could have developed in other ways. But once capitalism did develop in Europe, then it spread to the rest of the world and then it cut off all other possibilities, I think. And that's, and that's, the, that's the reality we deal with. Uh, I, I think it's probably true also that uh, uh, the, the sort of descent into class society from, from a state of, of um, what Marx called primitive communism, where the, the sort of equality of poverty and, and low productivity of labor, then society divides into classes. And, and, and that gives, that, that is a disaster for those on the bottom. It's a disaster for the colonized people and so on, but only through that is, is, is the productivity of labor to de de developed through which we can now reforge a, a, a classless society on a, on a much higher basis. I don't, I, I think, you know, I, I'm a theoretician on these things, but I doubt it could have happened any other way. And, 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 it's, and it's relevant to this whole debate about you know, was colonialism a disaster for, for Māori in New Zealand, or, or, or were there advantages as well? Yeah, you know, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting debate from that point of view.
I, mean, I, I, I don't, you know, I think there is a danger, it does get Euro, Eurocentric, however, I think, you know, you've also got to look at the struggles and how they struggle with the third world, so you need to keep them very inspiring. For example, um, particularly if you're finding, oh my god, I'm so sick of politics, so I'm really just worn out, I'd suggest you go to the Philippines. For me, it was great. Because you just got people there that have got so much energy, and they, you know, they're, um, they're not only, they're fighting capitalism, but not only they, 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 they might get, um, they actually might face death for doing so, but they still keep doing it. So I still think we've you know, got to show some respect for that. And, you know, I think one thing I remember is there was a big uh, march they had on um, uh, about the environmental movement, and they, these Filipino activists, they carried around this, this brilliant cardboard um, uh, bulldozer. They made a cardboard bulldozer, and they carried it around on that for three hours. I don't know how they did it. <laughs> but I found that really inspiring. So, um, so yeah, so I, I don't, you know, I think you, know, you can build inspiration and ideas from all parts of the world in some ways. Uh, just referring to your point about na Nazism and sort of, the, and to, sort of the relationship between the far right and, and economics, it's not actually, I'm not sure I'd actually put it the way you did. Because I think that you need to look back to like 1919, um, where you've got the, the, the background was the Treaty of Versailles Conference, where there was a lot of very heavy um, economic consequences put on Germany, you know, to try and make them pay for the war, this sort of idea. And interestingly, one person that wrote a critique of this and said, look, this will be a disaster, was Keynes. It was one of his first books. So he actually said, wrote a book called The Economic Consequences of the Peace. So I think you can look at that and say that that almost set up a, a situation where someone like Hitler would get in. You know, so it can, it was so, so much, um, the, the German economy was just wound down, the, all, the, all the money was going out, they had hyperinflation, so people got peaceful. Um, and if, in, rather than, ne, rather than some necessary relationship between neoliberalism and Nazism, actually it was actually more complicated than that. I think that what you had is you had the neoclassics or the traditional um, conservatives. I think it was about the, sort of the, about the 1931 election. Said, you know, sort of they, Hitler didn't quite have enough um, uh, votes to get into government, but the Conservatives said, we'll put them in because we think we can control them. So that, that was them, the, the, the neoclassists that put them that put the Hitler in, thinking they were going to control them, and they couldn't. But, but ironically, um, Hit, you know, Hitler, in terms of the Times, actually was more some stuff that were more Keynesianism. He actually started spending money so, to make art, which actually helped the German economy. So in a very strange way, it, was, you know, it wasn't quite neoliberalism, but also I'd say that it's the neoclassism that can't be put into power. Great. Uh, any other questions? Um, yeah, I have a question regarding the future of capitalism, socialism, and otherisms, uh, especially looking at Europe and recent events there. So since two years ago, the decision to stop buying Russian energy and now the energy prices in Europe are really high. Uh, so companies can't produce stuff now. So you have like the industrialization of Europe really. German, German production's gone down something like thirty seven percent just last year. And you and with this you've got the rise of uh, right wing parties. The alternative, the alternative for the Deutschland party is the second largest party in Germany. Mm. And you know it's the German, the, the, the European economies more generally are in this really bad shape. So, what do you, so how do you think that will influence the future of capitalism or, or whatever? You know, it was like you were talking about how, that's the first speaker talking about changes and trends and how things change over time. How, what role does this play? Yeah, unfortunately, it probably has relationships to war as well. What's happening with Ukraine? So, um, I mean, just the, there was a school of thought which I thought was interesting, and this is not saying in terms of uh, supporting Russia or anything like that. Just is saying that it was pointed out that um, before the, the, the Russia-Ukraine war, 
there was quite a bit of economic activity happening in Eastern Europe, particularly between Germany and Eastern Europe. So that was doing quite well. You had the pipelines and things like that. So it has actually been suggested that perhaps one way to upset that and perhaps put the Americans back on top was one of the consequences that could have come across the war. Now, I'm not saying that this Putin is, I don't, I completely disagree with what he does, but the economic consequences, I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah, the, the, the stakes are very high in all of these things. Um, uh, there was a time when the United States could basically impose its will on just about any country in the world, uh, just through a combination of its economic and military force. And, and those days are gone now. It, it, it was unable to impose its will on Afghanistan, one of the most backward, economically backward countries in the world. And, and, and you know, they couldn't, they couldn't defeat the Taliban which was hated, it still is hated, by a lot of people in Afghanistan. Um, uh, and, and if that's true of the United States, it's even more true of Europe. The old powers of, 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 of Germany, uh, France, UK, they're, they're all extremely decrepit. Uh, and and these, these, these things will be sorted out by war, one way or the other. They, they, uh, another example, I think, similar to what you are talking about, is, is, is the situation Australia faces. Um, uh, the, their economy, they, they, they had a long boom too, built on, on the back of China, selling, selling um, ores and coal to China. And it's been the basis of, of the Australian economy for decades. But now they want to join the US war drive on, on, on China, you know, and it, it's going to have catastrophic economic consequences for Australia. But they're still driven to do it. They're still, they're still bound to the United States. And, and they, they, they really don't have a, have a solution. And, and it's, it's hard to sort of predict how it will pan out in the end. You can just see the dilemma that they face. And, and just very quickly, I, I think you talk about all the isms yeah. later on, and then what's likely to happen. I think um, Rosa Luxemburg, I think it was, put it extraordinarily well. She didn't actually, in this quote, talk about capitalism and socialism. She said it was either socialism or barbarism. And I think it's that barbarism and how, I think we're entering a bit of an ep epoch of that, which people like us believe the only solution of that is socialism, but still, yeah, I, I think we're in for quite a barbaric period in the History of um, in the history of the world. Um, any questions from the floor? We'll take this one in the back. First, uh, I want to ask: Where do you think will be the weakness of capitalism? Where the next uh, successful revolution could take place? Uh, <laughs> And that's probably James's point. If, if you had asked that question like 30 years ago at a meeting like this, we would have all been jumping over each other to name the country, whether it was Indonesia, Malaysia, um, um, etc. It's, it's, yeah. Um, and that's, I guess, what I'm, I'm sort of saying. It is, although there requires there to be socialist revolutions in order. Uh, to get out of this situation, I think we can. E it's more easy to name where more barbaric activities are going to be happening, unfortunately, than when a successful socialist revolution might be. But I'll leave it to my comrades on the right. <laughs> You're saying all the right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's a very difficult thing to predict um, because it depends on all sorts of kind of unknowable quantities. Uh, but you can make a few general points. I, I think the key to the world situation is now in Asia uh, and China in particular. I, I, I think you can say that without fear of competition. But that doesn't mean that the, yeah, the, the working class worldwide is stronger than ever before in, in numerical terms. 
um, and, and, and its sort of social weight in the world population is greater than ever before. But that growth has taken place in Asia and it's declined in, 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 in the old advanced countries. But it still doesn't answer the question of where the, where the next breakthrough is going to be. In, 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 in the early years of, of the 20th century, it was just assumed by everywhere that the first socialist revolution would be in Germany. Because Germany was the most advanced, had, had this massive working class, organized in unions, organized in mass political parties of the working class. And, and, and yet that's not what happened. There was a revolution in Germany after the, after the First World War, but it failed. Um, those, the, those organizations proved deficient. Where it did happen was in Russia, which nobody had really predicted, because Russia had a, a very tiny working class. But it, did, it does prove that it, it can take place in, in, in less favorable circumstances. It's not necessarily the biggest, strongest working class that makes a revolution first. That's all. Uh, I guess just to, um, I mean, I, my, philosophically, I'm probably more of a democratic socialist in that I prefer to get these things done by democratic means, of, peaceful means of all possible. However, I can recognise to some of my, to my colleagues um, that are more keen on revolution that the reform has got more difficult. And I think, or more difficult to sustain. And I think that's the useful thing we're talking about. Um, is that, um, so, yeah, but it, just in terms of revolutions and things, that's, it's not actually us that's going to decide it. I mean, I think generally, if you look over at history, that generally very unequal societies become very unstable. So it's actually the capitalists and they're going to be causing it. They're causing the problem. So that, that, that would be my response to that. It's just that, you know, in fact, Frank, so, I mean, I remember when I went to Russia, actually, um, it was one of these funny things you pick up when you're traveling, is that, you know, this was um, 2003, and even there you could see the extremes of wealth. You, could, you, get, you went from somebody on the street to this beautiful palace made of gold. And just, to me, I just remember thinking to this time, now I kind of understand why the Russian Revolution it's sort, of a, it's sort of a new facts. Sorry. Yeah, um, just to sort of piggyback off that point and maybe probe it something, um, it's sort of like a broad characterization of um, the revolutionary conditions where it's being unfavorable. But if I might sort of posit something, um, if you were to look at, like, say, Tahrir Square or the Eurobaidan or um, even in the, the context of New Zealand, um, you know, even as um, relatively small as the Percy Parker protest, it would appear that the problem is not that people are unwilling to act or to assemble. Um, would not be the problem is actually what next? That when these mass actions, which have been shown to be capable of removing governments, have done so, that the left is unable to capitalise and provide a better world. And if so, um, in a sort of, and in, in, in those conditions, um, what, do, what do you think we should take? What's sort of the, the way forward in the next few days? Well, I'll start. Um, uh, uh, I, I think absolutely that is one of the conditions to have a, a, a revolutionary leadership, which is which has been sort of tested in battle and, and, uh, and, and can lead the revolution. That was the key difference between Germany and Russia in, in, in the early post-World War I years, that there was no such revolutionary leadership in Germany, even though all the, all the objective conditions were much more favorable in Germany. Um, uh, the, the, key, the key thing that made the difference in, in, in Russia was, was the existence of the Bolshevik party. Um, and and that, that is the thing that we can do, is, is to start building that revolutionary leadership. And, and, and that's, that is the task of the day. And it, and it can happen, it, it can be done in any country of the world. Um, I, I was thinking of one of the revolutionaries I admire was Thomas Sankara in Burkina Faso, who, who led a revolutionary government in the early 1980s. Um, and, and, and that was one of the most economically backward countries of Africa and the world, one of the poorest, and, and they made extraordinary strides. And, and, and Sankara is one of the finest Marxists, that, that, um, although he had a, a, a very short life before he was assassinated. 
you know, just in terms of revolution things, I think it's useful to, to th think back to where some of those ideas come from. And often I think some of the ideas we've got around revolution actually come from the French Revolution. That's almost mm -hmm. where a lot of those ideas started. Um, I'd highly recommend a book by Eric Hobsbawm called The Age of Revolution, where he, he starts going through that, so you can sort of see some of the of some of these ideas. But what I think is quite interesting is I think that um, there's some cultures and some countries that are more prone to revolution than others. They've got like a revolutionary culture. France is one example. I think the Philippines is another. Um, for example, you know, in the Philippines they've got about 9% of the um, 9% union membership in the private sector, which is roughly about the same as in New Zealand. But they get masses and masses of people on the street every May day. So there's obviously something different in the way that it operates that makes it easier to um, to, to those things. So yeah, so I think that somewhere somewhere in New Zealand, perhaps you know, the, the closest they've said they've come to a real break might have been about the 1913 strike. Whereas it's been quite New Zealand has actually been one of the, the rare countries which has actually kept democratic government for a lot longer in a continuous strain than other countries. There's actually a few countries that have actually done that, and New Zealand is one of them. Uh, did you want to say something, Robert? No, no, no. You okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you guys what your thoughts would be on the idea of maybe having a small scale democracy within the workplace. Because um, my, my, I, I haven't read Karl Marx's uh, Communist Manifesto, so I'm very baseline sort of um, understanding of communism that it's um, the means of production belonging to the workers rather than sort of one boss or like overlord that rules over everybody else and makes all decisions. Like, I, in my personal sort of dream or vision of the world, I would envision a world where instead of one owner of a company deciding who the supervisors are, all of the individual members of the company would come together and collectively to vote to, to agree who they want to be the supervisors rather than, yeah, I, I, that's sort of an idea that I've been developing in my head. I just wanted to sort of throw that out there and see what your thoughts on it are. Yeah, sure. No, I think it's, it's useful to note that even in so models of social democracy, you've only got political democracy. The other half of that was actually industrial democracy. So there was a whole sort of section of, like, of social democratic thought that never got implemented. Um, there was some push towards this in Sweden in the 1970s, um, where they're trying to um, have ideas of sort of more democracy in the workplace, and that actually led to some changes in terms of the way they designed their factories. So some of the, um, I think, some of the car factories actually, they said, well, if we organise in a more democratic way, then we have more worker input mm. into what's happening, we might get high productivity. So that's uh, sort of where some of those ideas come from. Um, I'm trying to remember, but I think it was a late, there was a, a New Zealand political review in the late 90s which had about three articles on this stuff. I just remember, I could, if I remember it, I'd be able to get better reference. But as I say, that's even been there, not only among the Marxist left, but also the social democratic left as well. Yeah, I guess right through history, there's been people interested in what you're interested in, and, and I don't, and uh, yeah, the last thing we want is what's happened at times in history where people have had huge barneys and, you know, had a punch up because, <laughs> because of whether you should be concentrating there at a workplace in a small way or concentrating on the larger society. I guess for me it has to be both and. That sounds really wanky. Call me now. Um, but yeah, so yeah, if, if, I think if, if that's yeah, if you have an interest in that, then tease it out and 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 have a look at that. I mean, there's some people would call that more of a syndicalist sort of approach, um, but certainly um, uh, yeah, and at, at, in, in for workplaces to be more democratic. Um, even under capitalism, as, as Joe said, there, there's, there's been attempts. Um, at the moment, we're probably in the worst of all worlds where we don't even have that, or that's not even been attempted along with everything else. Yeah, that's it's very, um, there's one boss and then he has many bosses. They, 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 what they say goes and nobody else gets to say, even though the vast majority of people, like there's more, it doesn't make sense, it's confusing. Sorry, can I just say one quick thing? Yeah, 
I think it's hugely ironic that um, we've got a Prime Minister who puts lots and pushed through to get rid of fair pay agreements, right? Which is actually one of the uh, mechanisms I think you could use to build up some of that, um, some of that understanding. So you get some some understanding from the shop floor going to management, so they're saying, hey, if you do it this way, it'll be great. Or, you know, this will get better productivity. But the interesting thing is, actually, it's Chris Lutzen that did this, but it was actually Chris Lutzen that was pushing the higher productivity, higher worker involvement stuff when he was boss of New Zealand, which I just think is a really interesting contrast of where he's gone now and what the priorities are. Mm. Uh, sorry, I'll come back in a minute. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, that's a Last year I read uh, in the news um, that uh, uh, the, the Austrian Communist Party was actually elected to office of one of their major cities. It was not national government, a city government. It might have been Salzburg or another similar city. Uh, and apparently this was a, a more, uh, the best example of what has been repeated in a few European cities of uh, communist or socialist parties really being elected mostly because of their answers to the housing challenge, uh, of the housing challenge of the housing economy. Uh, so I've been to Austria and Germany and, and Europe, and their, their housing situation is way better than ours, <laughs> really. Um, and uh, like, uh, yeah, we, we have a housing crisis, and in parts of Australia and Canada and uh, America, they have a housing crisis, and in the UK, they definitely have a housing crisis. And uh, lately, now Chris Luxon has, repealed the, that, that interest tax deductibility thing. This is going to hand uh, billions of dollars to the landlord class in New Zealand. I'm wondering, yes, I'm wondering if this could be an avenue of some greater consciousness in, in New Zealand or across our country. I'm wondering if you, if you have any uh, analysis or any view on, on, on their housing situation from a Marxist point of view or what you think about this this sort of thing, if you, if you, if you do. I yeah. know, oh, I just thought one thing I just wanted to add to, I'm really with Claire that you brought the idea that it also can be fossils that are involved in the class struggle too. Mm. So the question we're asking is the class struggle, because I think there's plenty of examples of where the bosses are actually doing the class struggle. I mean, if you're in a high inflation environment, and you're only offering a below inflation pay increase, that's, 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 you're trying to improve your class position in a way, in the same way. Um, so it's, um, it also relates to how capital is structured in companies too. Um, the pri private equity firms can take over a company. So that's, that's also an element of, of class struggle in that too. Um, so you know, they put a focus on short term profitability um, over the long term sustainability of the company. So I mean, but yeah, just just in terms, yeah, but that doesn't sort really of relate to housing. But I think that, that was quite a useful point in sort of saying we're talking about class struggle. That it's actually the other side that are doing the class struggle as well. And I guess on on the housing, I mean, the good Marxist or even sort of communist um, uh, methods of work we were always taught was to seize on issues that really are affecting people and you're absolutely right i mean housing is one of them and there's not there's not really many players out there sort of really um, taking that issue to task um, i think one of the problems in new zealand and i was just reading the figures today of uh, that in our housing market it's the most probably petty bourgeois housing it's all owned we've got five, so many thousand people owning one house each. Um, whereas in more in Europe, the uh, houses are often more owned by big companies or by local authorities or that. And so you can get the thing of rent strikes going and a whole lot of other things like that. But that's, that's just the thing we need to look at. So um, um, I would encourage you, there, there are, um, there are a few people around uh, doing doing some work uh, on that. So again, if, if it's an issue that I think, yeah, you know, those are the issues we can. What we're probably lacking is a socialist or communist party with the ability to do what happened in Austria. And you're right, it's happened in a couple of um, uh, cities in um, 
both in Belgium and in, um, I think, um, even in the Netherlands. But, um, yeah, um, I think it's a great issue and it needs agitation on. Uh, this is one of the things I came across when I was standing for workers now in Wotara Fanyu. Housing was, last year, housing was the big issue that people responded to. I, 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 I took my leaflets on the rising cost of living and, and, and uh, uh, union issues and, and, and so on. But housing was the thing that was on people's minds. And these were all people who were in houses, you know, because I was knocking on doors. Um, uh, uh, it, it's, an abs it, it's an absolute crisis in, in, in New Zealand at the moment, and I think you're right, it's probably worse here than just about a anywhere else in the developed world. Um, our our programme was, was to demand a, a, a massive programme of building state houses from the government. Now, that, the, the, the Labour government, which was in power then, said, well, we're building state houses. <laughs> but then, they, and they built a few, I mean... You know, a, 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 yeah, a, a few. But then they rent them out at market rents. And so they may as well be privately owned houses. The whole point of the state house program that, that the first Labour government brought in in the 1930s was that rents were capped. You, you had affordable rents. You had a maximum proportion of the income of the tenants was, was to be paid. In, and I think it was 15 or 20 percent, mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, our program was 10, no more than 10 percent. That's, that's what the situation is in Cuba, isn't it? Still, no. I think no more than 10% of, of, of the tenant's income should go and rent. And, 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 but it's a matter of demanding these things. Because, you know, the, the Luxons of the world, he's one of them. <laughs> he's got seven houses. And, and, and he represents a much, much broader layer. These, these are the sort of parasitic capitalists who are trying to make profits without production. Um, uh, uh, just, just, by, just by owning and, and, and renting houses. Yes, it's definitely a, a, a thing we need to be organised around. Uh, on the other hand, there's other things as well. <laughs> you know, it's, and, and it won't be sold short of you know, taking power out of the profit makers, uh, uh, ultimately. The, 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 the Labour government in, in the 1930s had a certain leeway, which doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. They, they were able to do it um, uh, by pouring capital into it, and, and they, you know, some of the capital, some of the wealthiest capitalists in New Zealand got rich through that scheme. Fletcher, the, the Fletcher family in particular. That's that's not going to happen again. It, it won't be the same thing. But this, the same demand for state-owned houses with guaranteed tenancy and, and rents capped at a certain percentage of, of, of the tenant's income. Uh, sorry, I, I also wanted to answer your question. I, I'm all for I, I'm all for any kind of organisation of, of workers within the within the workplace around around their needs and you know uh, uh, to, to put forward their needs. It's the it's the germ of unionism, I think. But you do have to recognise that the bosses are not going to like it because no. it, because it in, interferes with their prerogatives. The, the, the workers are not there to to meet their own needs. They're they're there because they. They serve the profit interests of the boss, and as soon as that no longer serves the profit interest, they'll be down the road. So, so as long as you keep that in mind, then it's a it's it's a it's a it's a starting point. It's very difficult develop. to go, but I feel like you would have to start a company based on those sort of values in order to sort of like lead by example. First, it would be hard yeah. to change a workplace that's already so like um, deep. In like the culture of the movie, so heavily ingrained in that. We probably have time for two more questions, if that's all right. Um, Jaira, did you have a question? Um, it, was, it was just kind of like a broad, short question about what you guys thought about community land trusts as a possible and no solution or alleviation to the housing crisis in New Zealand. Can you explain a bit more how they work? Oh, uh, a community land trust is... Well, in, in other countries, uh, it's basically like communities get together. A lot of the time, it's to stop gentrification in communities, but they also control rents. And the, the idea is to make non-market housing. So uh, like over time, the rent stays the same, but like because of inflation, it gets cheaper overall. Uh, and usually, they have like tripartite boards as well as like a form. No, it's, it's interesting. It's not something I know much about, but I think there is some interesting models there in Germany, particularly in terms of 
long-term renting, you've got you know better rights, but also I think they've got um, to housing cooperatives and things in here that we've running for years, which are quite interesting. I think with all of these things, there's three or four different things that, that have come up tonight. It's um, um, yeah, re reform. There's always been a bit of a dichotomy in sort of communism, Marx, and the circles of you know, are you a revolutionary or a reformist sort of thing. And I, I think that has been unhelpful in, in many cases um, because <laughs> you can't go out there and start the revolution tomorrow. A, there will only be one of you, and <laughs> yeah, um, uh, you'll probably get put away um, for doing so. So, so it's. I, I, I think most people are politicised or by trying to do a reform. And if you get a success out, it's when reforms just become the end in themselves that I think, um, and, and really society doesn't change. So, yeah, I think um, in my old Maoism, of let a hundred flowers blossom. <laughs> uh, do all of these things, get involved in these things, um, but. On the other hand, sort of learn from them, learn about the society a bit more and sharpen our analysis of how we can get whole societal change, which is absolutely needed, as, as well as the areas that we work in. So uh, I just wanted to say um, something that, that uh, you said, James, was, um, and I'm surprised no one else has said anything about it, to be honest. Um, you said, uh, you know, there's a question of whether, uh, you know, colonization was a good thing for Maori. Uh, and I think that's something that really has to be contested, um, because, and especially with what's going on in Gaza and in Palestine for the last 80 years, with, uh, you know, who are actually more than that, the past 110 years or whatever since, you know, Jewish migration. But, um, you know, what, what's been going on there? You know, I, 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 so, what, sort of like my, my question is, um, you know, you know, if we say, let's say, in 50 years' time from now, um, you know, Palestinians, you know, from their current state, let's say, 50 years' time, Palestinians, are, you know, are better off than they are now. You know, they can vote, they can own a home uh, in Israel. Uh, you know, um, they can, uh, you know, you know, maybe, um, uh, you know, they can, they can own a bit of land in Israel. Um, would Would you call that better off for Palestinians? And then building on that, um, you know. Back in 1840, before the Treaty of Waitangi, before you know colonisation in New Zealand, Maori actually had an economy. Maori had uh, you know had a culture and history. So my question to you is: is where in the world uh, would you say that those who have lost their the ownership of their land, uh, their language, their culture, have lost their autonomy, have lost their tonga? Uh, where would you say in the world that those sets of people are better off? Uh, simple answer: nowhere. Yes. Yet, yeah, uh, 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 and that goes for for the original uh, imperialist countries of the world too. In England, people lost their land too. They were, the peasants were driven off the land, forced into factories. It was a disaster there, just as much as it was a disaster for Maori when 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 capitalism reached these shores as well. The the the, the point I'm making is is is. Not to contest the disaster, it was it it, it, it was it, it was truly a disaster, but uh, but that has that, that's the history that that is is the whole of, of human of the history of humans in the last ten thousand years. The descent into 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 the horrors of class society with, with all of them, but through which. The productive capacity of human labour has been raised, and, and now we're at the point where, where the, the horrors can be done away with, and, 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 and we can institute a class of society on a higher, higher basis. I don't, I can't see any other way that it would have ever happened. But it, it, in a way, that's irrelevant anyway, because it has happened. You know, uh, uh, I, I'm not trying to, I, I'm not trying to say, you know, I'm not trying to. Argue the, the Shane Jones line or whatever it is, uh, right. uh, that, that, um, because because they play down the disaster. 
that happened, you know, the people who, who, who were just sort of apologists for, for colonialism and so on. It, it was a disaster, but it was, it, 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 it's there and it's happened, and, and, and we have to look to the future rather than try and try, well, try and... I, I would say it's probably ongoing. I mean, you look at Igumato. Oh, it's, it's, certainly, that, that, was what, that was what set the relationship of forces. That, that, that's what created this, this, this exploited proletariat of, of both migrant and, and, and indigenous sources. And, 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 and it maintains the disposition, yes, for, for sure. The, the, uh, the, um, the, the defeats of the past carry on into the, into the present, for sure. Any uh, concluding remarks anyone wants to offer? Oh, complete. No, I think I sort of gave my conclusion before, which is. Oh, well, first of all, thank you very much for giving us yeah, the opportunity, yeah. bringing me out of retirement. <laughs> um, and and, and it just does just, just my pacemaker at heart so good <laughs> to see so many young people in a room actually talking about these things because I, I think we've gone through a few generations of, yeah, um, a real dearth of. Um, uh, young people, young students, young workers, even interested in socialism or what it might mean and that sort of thing. But I've just noticed maybe the last four or five years it's sort of coming back again. And so the fact that you are here um, discussing these issues um, uh, is, um, is, is really good. And, and my point is, do, do get involved um, in, yeah, whether it's worker democracy, whether it's housing, whether it's something else, yeah, get, get involved in that and learn from that and hone your sort of analysis at the same time as well as getting into the other sort of larger issues as well. Uh, kia ora koutou. Thank you, James. Oh, sorry, Joe. <laughs> the Jays. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, no, I just wanted to re re return to one of the points Robert made in terms of we're only talking about the economics and not so much about the superstructure. I mean, I just had some notes here I didn't think I'd be use yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it generally, it's, I think it's, you know, if we look at the political situation in New Zealand, particularly with the, the last few elections, I think people are getting very politically apathetic because it seems like there's not much difference between the parties, particularly Labour and National, and that they, you know, they don't seem to really want to challenge capitalism in any way. They're only tweaking around the edges. Um, and I think that it's fair to say that um, you know, the, this, the last Labour government had an absolute majority, but still got very little done. I mean, the only th major thing it got done was fair pay agreements, you know, which is just a moderate change to the um, industrial laws to facilitate industrial bargaining, very moderate in real terms. But even that got rolled back by the Nats um, immediately if they got into office before any one agreement had been um, settled. So I think that's an example we should be learning from. Um, so there's two things that I think the serious political left should consider in relate to those disappointments. First of all, I think we need to encourage our political representatives to be less forgiving of bad faith political actors. So if you get actors that are trying to obfuscate or delay policies they don't like, particularly that have been democratically elected on, that, um, that they get pushed back on. Yeah? Um, and secondly, I think it's useful for the, the, the left to consider the, the issue of capital strikes. So, you know, when a worker withdraws his labour, you know, that's sort of saying, I want something different to change, well, a capitalist can come along and withdraw their capital. And sort of, and this is relevant to some of the, what's happening with some of the debates around a wealth tax, is one of the, the, uh, the concerns is that if you bring in a wealth tax, you'll get capital flight. Yeah, that all the capital will leave the country. I think we just need to have a serious conversation about capital strikes. Why and how they happen and how we might combat them. And I think one of the um, interesting examples you can actually look at is the first state government. It just seems that the, Mike, the government of Michael Joseph Savage, in particular, seem to have a lot more backbone than the ones we've got now. Um, for example, you know, in 1938, um, the British banking establishment decided that they that uh, they weren't going to renew New Zealand's um, international loans. This would be the equivalent of your bank ringing you up and you had a mortgage with us and they say, oh, we really don't want you to have a mortgage anymore. So um, this was, this was sort of the 1938 financial crisis, the exchange crisis. 
Um, and it was actually strong suggestions that the British banks and the British um, political establishment were actually objecting to um, the, the welfare system that Labour were trying to bring in, and also the system of import control. So it was actually a, a capital strike that was political. Um, and uh, Seth, 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 um, Michael Joseph Savage at the time called this the loan terms intolerable, objectionable, unnecessary, and humiliating. So he didn't mince his words. And around the, around the similar time, there was a big debate going on into how they were setting up the New Zealand health system, particularly the, this, well, because New Zealand actually got one of the first um, systems of universal health care. And there was a big debate they were having with the, the New Zealand arm of the British Medical Association. And they, I, they were the, you know, represented the doctors in New Zealand. So the, the, uh, the, New, Zealand, the uh, New Zealand government was sort of saying, OK, we want to give you a fixed fee for every consultation. And the doctors were saying, no, 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 it's an important part of our, of our profession that we can charge something on top. So they wanted to keep a capitalist element to it, and that was something that, that Savage was strongly opposed to. Um, and what Savage actually did was a, a meeting, famous meeting in, in May 1939 with the doctors and Savage and a few of the other ministers. And on the issue of maternity services, Savage lost his patience and uh, threatened that um, he would simply treat the doctors that if they were on strike, and that he would go and get his own doctors to work for the government if need be. And I think there was one um, particular thing he told the doctors in 1939 that struck me when I was actually thinking about some of the disappointments over fair pay agreements, was that Savage said to the doctors in 1939, let us be quite frank, we are not going to do any more waiting. So that's, um, I think, I'm just trying to think, imagine if we had governments like that that stood up to things to get policy through that had democratic well now. Great, it sounds like we've got um, room for a future panel on the Labour Party in the state. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, give a round of applause for uh, very Oh, I'm very sorry. Uh, uh, just this question of where you begin. Um, uh, people have raised a couple of uh, ideas about different ways of organising. This is the question I was trying to, um, I, I, was, I was grappling with, with, with in, in the election campaign I, I ran last week, last year. And I, I, I think actually right now election campaigns are quite a good way of beginning because they, they give an uh, opening to raise a whole range of ideas about a whole range of, 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 of political questions. And, and, and give you a kind of excuse to knock on people's doors and, and have these conversations and, and make a start. Um, I, I've, I just brought along if anybody wants to, to look at some of the statements our work has now put out in that campaign. I've got copies of a, a bunch of them. Things are sort of how, how what's a working class uh, uh, solution to the housing crisis. What's a working class? Uh, how can we fight the rising costs of living? How can we? How, how can we deal? How, how can we challenge the the super exploitation of migrant labour uh, and, and, and and things like that? Um, uh, uh, and so I, I just offer those to people if they want to have a look at them. Uh, take 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 whatever copies you like to uh, and read them. Uh, and my little China graph too, which I think is one of the most important things people need to see in order to bring your consciousness up to the, the present world. Um, uh, and if anybody wants to join with me, give me your email address and I'll be in touch. Great. So uh, just two final points before we wrap up tonight. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the left, either um, directly through reading about it or just uh, coming along to events about the left like this, uh, go to platypus1917.org. Um, like I mentioned, we've got a film screening on campus in two weeks. Um, you're also welcome to join us at the pub afterwards if anyone would like to come, including the audience or the panelists, whoever uh, feels like it. We're um, not sure yet, maybe Cave Road or something like that. It seems like the closest option. Uh, other than that, thank you all for coming and thanks so much to the panelists for giving us your time.